Let me now introduce you all to the resource speaker for today. Madam Geeta Gopi is a rehabilitation practitioner and a psychologist. She is the director of professional development and program at the Shaha Shakti Karan Trust, Kuchin, with over 30 years of experience in helping children with special needs. She's worked in international schools following an American curriculum for inclusive settings primarily for more than 15 years. She has done intensive work in curriculum development, adaptations, behavioral management, coordinating and promoting best educational practices using UDL principles among staff and parents. She has also launched the early academic series, a teacher's kit for teaching early English language and basic mathematics based on the universal design of learning. Who has then her to orient us about the challenges faced by children with special needs, especially with that of learning difficulties. It's a pleasure to have you here with us, ma'am. But before I hand over the podium to you, I'd like to share with all our participants that the session would be for two hours. The session would begin with a presentation by the resource speaker, followed by a Q&A discussion. So and posted all your queries in the chat box. And for us to focus on the speaker sharing, we would be turning and switching the chat mode to the host and the panelists so that we can all focus on the speaker sharing during her presentation. Wish you all her happy learning. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Geeta. Uh, Revati, the, all the participants and the Ibliti group. Uh, happy to be back here. So uh, we are going on to our new presentation. The, the inclusive program is on and I'm sure you all have gone through several uh, uh, workshops relating to different modules. So I'll just uh, start sharing screen and get without much uh, time wastage, get into today's uh, workshop. Okay, today's uh, workshop uh, is about an introduction to academic challenges, part one. We are going through uh, to go through uh, academic challenges, particularly that relates to learning difficulties or specific learning disorders, uh, which initially start off as learning difficulties, manifest as learning difficulties, and then, you know, if not addressed, then becomes a disorder. To go through a quick recap of what you have had in this uh, in this uh, series of workshops, I'm sure you have gone through, uh, you know, having uh, the mindset of a professional teacher, how much power the teacher wields in the educational setup over the children, uh, children's progress and development. Uh, I'm sure you have also uh, had an introduction into what is inclusion, how to set up an inclusive uh, environment in regular schools, how to um, keep, uh, you know, uh, setting, uh, in introduce, set up, and run a successful functional student support system within the regular uh, school environment. And last but not the least, even including parents, uh, you know, parental acceptance, how they, uh, you know, how uh, parents would uh, start accepting special needs conditions and their acceptance into the mainstream. So all these things I'm sure has been covered in the previous uh, workshop. And today's uh, academic module, we're going to go through the module four, which is um, academic challenges and identification. So we're going to go through learning disabilities and other academic challenges. For the coming, you have things such as uh, workshops relating to assessment tools, cognitive intervention, handwriting intervention, remedial English and math intervention. So that is to follow. But this, uh, before that, today it's just an introduction to different kinds of academic challenges that you find with children who have learning difficulties. So an overview of today's workshop, we are going to get an insight into what is specific learning disability or specific learning disorder as it is more commonly called nowadays. The academic areas that uh, are affected or you find difficulties in when these children have these disorders and then management strategies, general strategies on how to manage these conditions. 
So just to go into what is uh, SLD, and uh, we are going to just refer back to the IDEA Act, uh, which uh, says that uh, learning disability is a disorder which uh, in which children seem to have one or more psychological processes uh, where the child will have difficulties or challenges. In. And these pro uh, psychological processes involve uh, understanding or using uh, both spoken and written language. And also it manifests as a, in an imperfect or um, a difficult uh, challenging environment where they have difficulties in developing and retaining uh, age appropriate listening, thinking, speaking, reading, writing, and mathematical skills. So all these um, uh, manifestations do appear, but we are going to go into more specifics of specific learning dis uh, disabilities with special uh, reference to DSM-5. DSM-5 actually was the first breakthrough and it came in uh, 2013 after a lot of division uh, revisions. And here in, uh, in 2013, the DSM-5 that came in actually took away the IQ achievement and academic uh, progress discrepancy as a requirement. Instead, what it uh, focused on was whether the child has difficulties in one of these areas, which is reading, writing, arithmetic. And if the child continues to have these difficulties, uh, even after six months of targeted instruction or help. So basically, we are moving away from more of a disability or a permanent condition to a condition where changes can be brought in. So uh, only if the child has... Uh, shows these difficulties and you've given six months of targeted help and despite that there is very minimal progress then only you would go in for more formal diagnostic assessment of uh, specific learning disorders otherwise we just take it as having learning difficulties in all these areas so what are the uh, challenges in the academic skills uh, that uh, children usually uh, show so academic skills are usually below the child's current age level. That is, they, they may not display age appropriate grade level uh, academic skills. And these uh, lack of skills or deficits in these skills causes challenges in performance uh, at school, uh, later on in their adulthood, at workplace. And also it, uh, it does show up even in several everyday day-to-day -day activities. Most of these challenges uh, begin during the primary school years. However, in some children, although it may not, it may be there, but it may not be obvious or identified until later on in life, when the academic and daily life demands and expectations become much more advanced. So, uh, in these cases, we have uh, we know that uh, you know uh, uh, these kind of challenges do exist. But however, in some children, because it may be mild or the child may have kind of had some coping strategies to mask it, it becomes more obvious when the academics and the uh, similar kind of life demand gets more, uh, as, uh, more and more according to age. So one thing we have to remember when we talk about specific learning disability is uh, the, these learning difficulties are not due to certain other kinds of uh, disorders or disability conditions. So there is a kind of um, eliminating uh, the other dis uh, disabilities uh, and because similar kind of learning problems do exist even in other kinds of disabilities. So uh, academic difficulties which are not due to intellectual disability where the IQ is uh, significantly subaverage along with adaptive behavior deficits, visual impairment, hearing impairment, lack of proper schooling and proper instruction, difficulties in uh, speaking a certain language. For example, if they're not native speakers of the language and they're having their medium of instruction in, in a language which is not their native tongue, Difficulties in understanding uh, the language, which is similar to, uh, you know, if it is not in their native language, and as well as environmental or uh, economic disadvantage, you know, if they are from low socioeconomic background, if they are having, if they're coming from a very remote area background where uh, academic learning is not very prominent. 
So if the learning difficulties are due to any of these, then they, they are not considered specific learning disability. So what is a specific learning di disability? Trying to understand what uh, it is, let's get into it. It is first and foremost, a neurodevelopmental disorder, and therefore it has a biological origin. So it is not just an academic problem, it has a neurodevelopmental base. Quite often SLD is a hidden uh, or an invisible disability because the children look perfectly normal and they seem to be very bright and intelligent just like the other children in the classroom. However, they still face difficulties in, the, uh, in learning, especially in the academic areas or the behaviors and skills which are necessary for acquiring academics. So what are the different kinds of difficulties and challenges that we, they face? And uh, some of the most prominent areas where difficulties are seen is in the cognitive processing, which are related to learning, particularly in academic learning. And this occurs because then uh, the kind of electrical synapses that take place in the brain, in the, that is involved in the functioning of the brain, there may be slight alterations. It can be likened to more like, you know, if you have an electrical circuit, sometimes uh, you may have a cross connection or a loose connection because of which there may be slight hitches and glitches in the function. So SLD can be likened to something like that. Difficulties in information processing, uh, information received through all the different senses, particularly visual and auditory, and uh, which uh, interfere in learning basic reading, writing, and math skills and difficulties in demonstrating, uh, you know, the skills that they have learned. So uh, all these, uh, because of, uh, you know, what they have, uh, the processing difficulties and the cognitive related difficulties that they have, they also um, have deficits relating to developing age appropriate skills. Um, in uh, several areas, but more so manifested as academic uh, difficulties. They also have, apart from all these, they also have difficulties in higher level executive functioning skills. And what are these executive functioning skills? These are skills such as organization, you know, being able to organize their space, their bags, their academic skills, etc. cetera. Um, being able to manage time, that is finishing uh, tasks in a timely manner or getting ready on time. So managing time, being able to, uh, you know, uh, do things within a certain time frame. Abstract reasoning, if things are not in concrete objects or concrete form, to visually uh, or, uh, you know, to abstract, imagine uh, abs uh, abstract concepts, they may have difficulty in that. Attention, that is being able to attend uh, to uh, certain, um, you know, activities or uh, things that they're doing for an X amount of time. Also memory, which is both uh, short term and long term memory may be affected. So these are the higher level executive functioning skills, which are also very vital for developing academic skills. And if these are affected, naturally, they will have their repercussions or spilling, rippling effect in acquiring academics. Difficulties beyond academics can also be observed because they impact their social interaction. Because of all these academic difficulties, executive functioning skill difficulties, what it uh, does is it has psychosocial impact on the child and the environment around them. And therefore, their social interaction might get affected with whether it is with family, whether it's with friends, teachers, or if it's the workplace with colleagues, uh, because a lot of these children go through extreme uh, stress, anxiety, and similar kind of, um, um, you know, psychosocial difficulties uh, because of the struggle that they go through in uh, processing. And if uh, family or the school or the uh, their peer group or their uh, colleagues at workplace, etc., are not understanding enough, or are not giving them the right kind of support that they need, definitely it has a, a very adverse impact on, their, on the kind of social bonding and relationships that they build with these people. Uh, having uh, said that, just to understand what is the magnitude of this problem, 
the prevalence is pretty high. Uh, almost, uh, you know, 2.3 million students are diagnosed with SLD and receive services under IDEA in the US. And it represents almost 35% of all students receiving special education services. Students identified as SLD have their basic deficits in language and reading. So a majority of them, 75 to 80% of these students who have SLD have their deficits more in the language and the reading areas. And then there are 60% adults who have severe literacy problems who may have gone undetected or undiagnosed or untreated learning disabilities. So if you look at the general school going population, by and large, in, you know, globally, we find around five to 15% of school age children struggle with some form of SLD or the other. And an uh, estimated 80% of these, again, as I said earlier, do relate to reading disorders, but uh, very commonly known as dyslexia. One third of people uh, who have learning dis uh, disabilities also see, uh, you know, have a comorbid situation, which is uh, ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Prevalence in the mainstream school. Uh, So uh, when we talk about prevalence in the mainstream school, uh, we also see uh, that children be, uh, between the years, uh, five to six years are more at risk. Um, and, you know, uh, it, as I said earlier, it kind of is visible more during the pre-primary primary years. Five to 15% of uh, children in mainstream schools do show these signs and it's said that it's more common in boys than in girls, although this is a contentious issue now. Uh, primarily because in many cultures, in many, um, uh, you know, especially the Eastern cultures, a lot of import, academic importance is given to boys' education rather than girls. So therefore it is more, uh, if boys do not underperform, then that is noticed much more than girls underperforming. But however, if, if you look at, uh, you know, the urban areas and places where boys and girls education is equally high, we find we do not really find a, a big discrepancy between the uh, boy and girl uh, occurrence ratios. So what do we do when the prevalence is so high? Uh, early identification is very important and intervention, the right kind of intervention so that whatever gaps in learning that they are, uh, you know, are present can be plugged in at a very early age and that will set them up for better success later on in school life. So let's go over to the causes of specific learning disabilities. What causes th this kind of an issue? Family history and genetics it could be one cause. A family history of learning disorders or uh, you know learning difficulties in the family increases the risk of a child developing the same disorder. So that is a very high coincidence. Quite often when we take case history from uh, children who visit our clinic, we find that somebody in the family, either from the mother's side or the father's side, uh, have had similar kind of issues. Um, uh, you know, that there is a very high incidence of uh, family history and genetics. It is also not very uncommon to find siblings who have uh, SLT. Then uh, if you look at, you know, the, uh, the earlier aspects before the child is born, prenatal and uh, neonatal risk. So if there is poor um, intrauterine growth uh, difficulties, if there is exposure to substances like you know, alcohol or drugs during pregnancy, prematurity and low birth weight. A lot of these kind of prenatal uh, risks which cause other developmental disorders can also uh, cause uh, SLD. Apart from this, there's also trauma, which is like psychological trauma, extreme trauma or abuse in early childhood may affect brain development and can increase the risk of developing SLD. 
Physical trauma can also um, offset these kind of difficulties like severe head injuries or severe infections of the nervous system such as meningitis, encephalitis, etc. So sometimes these infections can also alter the functioning of the brain and therefore have physical, these physically traumatic uh, trauma can offset uh, SLD-like uh, uh, difficulties. Environmental exposure uh, to, you know, toxic substances such as lead, uh, which is very, you know, uh, nowadays it's decreasing, but still uh, it used to be present in a lot of uh, children's toys. So, you know, presence of these things or such certain places, there are a lot of pesticidal environmental hazards. All these have been, uh, you know, uh, 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 responsible for causing a lot of um, uh, learning difficulties. So uh, having looked at the causes, now we are going to come into the classification and the types of different kinds of SLD, how it is uh, understood. Most common ones is, are known as dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dysgraphia. Dyslexia talks is primarily associated with reading and related language-based processing skills. So it is reading and comprehension and understanding of reading skills. Also, uh, some bit of uh, uh, listening also comes into it. Dyscalculia, it affects a person's ability to understand numbers, learn math facts, do calculations, etc. Dysgraphia affects a person's ability to um, manipulate the pencil, do, uh, you know, actually do uh, writing, uh, handwriting ability and fine motor skills that are associated with handwriting, drawing, etc. Some, something called non-verbal LD as well, where children have difficulties understanding body language or facial expressions um, or uh, into the speech uh, intonations of the, of the other person. Difficulties in eye-hand coordination, sense of direction, etc. Uh, oral or written language disorder. This is closely associated with dyslexia and dysgraphia. Uh, sometimes they may be able to speak, but if they have to speak on le at length on a particular topic or have to speak in complete sentences, uh, they may have difficulty in holding forth a conversation, etc. Uh, so difficulties, such difficulties as an oral expression may be seen. If similar kind of difficulties may also be seen in written expression, not just with handwriting skills, but even putting their thoughts uh, on paper as expressive writing or creative writing. So if they have to compose a written piece, do a composition, uh, frame a sentence of their own, they may have, the idea may be there in them, but to put it in written form may be difficult. Uh, spe uh, specific reading comprehension deficits, again, very closely, ref um, you know, uh, uh, associated with dyslexia. Uh, they have uh, particularly uh, great difficulties in, um, in comprehension skills. They may be, even if they are able to read reasonably well, they, uh, they do not uh, process the information correctly and accurately and precisely. So they may have difficulty understanding what they've read. Difficulties in making inferences. Uh, if uh, the, you know, it's what is called reading between the lines, reading something and trying to derive me, uh, different meaning what may not be explicitly stated in the text. So this is like a higher order comprehension skill. Again, these kind of uh, skills uh, may be uh, difficult. And these are all closely associated with dyslexia. Why I've mentioned these separately is because these also uh, need to be worked on, especially with the uh, older kids, if, they, if their basic skills are pretty much intact, uh, the higher order skills still need working on. So the common areas affected in uh, SLD is oral language, listening, speaking, uh, reading skills are affected, written expression, and writing. So um, we talk about the reading challenges. I'm sure many of you have been, you know, most of you are educators or people who've been working with kids. 
So I would like to uh, throw it open to the participants, like what are the uh, kind of reading challenges you, that you're faced in the classroom with uh, children? So if you can just, uh, let's discuss, uh, you know, what are the more commonly seen reading challenges in the classroom? So I would like the participants to, uh, you know, give their input on this. So we're getting response from the uh, participants and they're saying with pronunciations, fluency, reverses, decoding, comprehension, reading reverses, reading without comprehension, mispronunciation, skipping of sentences. Okay, I think that's a fair uh, um, amount of uh, uh, pretty much most of the things have been covered. So I'll just do a quick, um, you know, a quick summing up of what are the different reading challenges, just summed up in a few points, which already the participants have uh, put forth. So reading challenges, they have specific difficulties with visual or auditory pro uh, processing part of the language. So when we say visual and auditory processing part, just like everybody, uh, some of you mentioned, yes, understanding um, alphabets, words, being able to decode them, reversals, being able to listen to the uh, sound and write the letter or vice versa, all this um, form part of visual and auditory processing part of language. Phonetic knowledge, that is the sound letter association and how it blends and segments to uh, form words or write words. Word recognition and decoding. So being able to either phonetically decode or through the whole word approach, uh, read the words. Reading fluency, that is being able to read in a smooth, uh, in an even speed and with an even speed and pace without a lot of struggle and stopping or without having to sound out painfully every word that they're reading and to uh, read at a certain uh, speed and with accuracy. And then of course, reading comprehension that is understanding what they're reading. So pretty much all these uh, constitute the different kinds of reading challenges that our children face. Going into the writing challenges in the classroom, uh, again, I would like the participants to contribute what do they think uh, or what have the what are the different kinds of uh, writing challenges that they've experienced through their students in the classroom. So we have a quite number of response saying spelling, slow writing, uninterested in writing and making a lot of excuse for it, capitalization, letter formation, skipping, Organization of thoughts, word reversal, pencil grip, jumble letters, inverted letter writing, slow writing, speed. Yes, uh, so that's that's good. It's uh, it's, it's a lot of uh, things that they have covered. So just to sum up again, difficulties can be seen in handwriting. So handwriting means the posture, the way they hold the uh, pencil or the writing tool. Uh, the way the letters are formed, uh, uh, the size uh, of the letters, how they uh, align the, uh, you know, how they use the line and the space and the, in the exercise book or the writing page, all these uh, difficulties seen in handwriting. Spelling difficulties, again, there may be a lot of spelling errors or again here, there may be uh, skipping certain letters or putting in certain addition of certain letters in their spelling, basically getting a lot of, and not just a few spellings. If you analyze their writing, a lot of spellings, even some of the most commonly used words may be spelt wrong or differently in different parts. In, in the same page, the same uh, word may be spelt in different ways. Writing fluency, which already uh, the participants have mentioned, that is the speed of writing as also the accuracy of writing. And then written expression, which is again, um, as everybody said, uh, organization of thoughts, being able to compose their ideas onto a written form and put it on paper and have a flow of ideas, especially when you're writing a composition, you know, being able to connect one sentence to the other and have a uh, flow through their uh, written expression. So all these are the challenges seen in writing. Going into the arithmetic challenges in the classroom, uh, again, uh, participants, please, uh, you know, share what are the, some of the arithmetic challenges or difficulties you have seen with students in the classroom. So we have two responses, says understanding the sound and symbol relationship, 
understanding the concepts tables logical reasoning wrong addition quantifying identification of numbers problem with counting difficulty in adding poor compliance during solutions tables understanding concepts and fractions difficulty in complex additions recognition and identifying sequencing having not having no interest in arithmetic concepts being taught not focusing on the classes yes again a very exhaustive uh, list thank you participants for being so um, you know forthcoming with the challenges that you faced in the classroom yes again to sum up the uh, basic number sense is where they have difficulties in understanding numbers understanding the relationship between different numbers in counting etc difficulties in computation or actual calculation so being able to uh, do mental math or use fingers or use you know uh, different strategies to do the basic operations that is addition subtraction multiplication and division and just as with reading and writing fluency math fluency which is like being able to do it at a certain required speed and with accuracy so you know both having a, a speed and accuracy uh and uh, developing a certain kind of fluency in solving math problems and then last but not the least so, uh, problem solving problem solving is again understand being able to understand the concepts being able to use those concepts and solve a particular problem especially when it comes to um you know a word problems and such where they have to reason out you know in a step by step fashion what is given as language and convert that into mathematical operations and even in uh, higher level maths uh, all the abstract concepts such as trigonometry uh, you know using theor theorems in geometry etc and derivations all these are very abstract concepts which involves a logical uh, reasoning sequencing and being able to solve those problems until you get to the end so all these are major uh, areas where arithmetic or mathematical challenges are seen in children uh so since we've talked about uh, all the different kinds of challenges you know i'll just uh, give a random a few case scenarios and we can uh, you know try and see what uh, what kind of disability is more prominent in those children uh case scenario 1 a leo is an 8 year old boy he's studying in second grade has average intellectual ability very good with oral skills but his academic performance has been declining so he started off reasonably okay but of late it's been declining and he's been uh, his performance has been coming down uh, when he is reading he sounds out every word uh, with a lot of effort so it's a lot of effortful reading comprehension is weak but listening uh, especially when it is reading comprehension if he has to read and understand by himself that is weak but listening comprehensions are pretty strong so what type of learning disability do you think it is so we have quite a few response from our participants which says it's dyslexia yeah yeah pretty much more or less it is dyslexia because it's very strongly associated with reading and if you and one of the very distinct uh, uh, you know uh, distinct features is if the reading comprehension is weaker and the spell, uh, listening comprehension is higher then you clearly know that it is because of the reading or the struggle in reading that comprehension is weak so um, you know that clearly it is a very clear cut case of a child having dyslexia or reading related disorders so let us go to case scenario 2 raghav is a boy studying in the fourth grade fourth standard good at uh, grasping concepts so he he is uh, quick to catch on but he is unable to do basic math operations accurately makes a lot of errors while doing addition subtraction uh, multiplication and division he has difficulty identifying the signs often gets confused between the mathematical operations also struggles uh, with learning the times table or the multiplication facts so what type of learning disability do you think it is and we have most of our participants responding with it as dyscalculia yes uh, very bang on correct uh, yes very clearly it, you know he if he is good at grasping concepts uh, doesn't have any issue there 
but it is primarily related to uh, math and math related number sense and basic operations and clearly it is discussed. Case three scenario, uh, Safa. Safa is a girl studying in uh, class three. She has great ideas when it comes to oral discussion. If there are a wide variety of topics, she contributes greatly. But when she has to put the same thing in writing, there are frequent spelling mistakes. She's unable to use proper punctuation and grammar and her sentences do not always make sense. So what type of learning disability is it? So most of our participants are responding it to be dysgraphia, ma'am. Okay, here I would just like to make a small correction. Dysgraphia is a more concerned, it is a writing disorder, but it is more concerned with being able to do the physical act of writing. Okay, so, but here, if you see, she can write. There is no issue in actually physically writing, but it is the written expression which is at uh, where there are difficulties. So in the written expression, she has difficulties with spelling, proper punctuation, grammar, the sentence word order is not correct. So therefore her sentences don't make sense. Even though the same topic, she is able to give great ideas when she, there is a class uh, oral discussion. So quite more than dysgraphia, this will be more like a written expression, uh, the, you know, the difficulties in written expression. Uh, dysgraphia is uh, when they also have the physical act of writing, that is manipulating a pencil and being able to write uh, the manual act of writing, they have difficulties in that. And uh, whereas with written, the children may have written expression uh, difficulties, they may not have dysgraphia. They're writing, the physical act of writing may be fine. It is only in written expression. And quite often, um, we find that children who have dis, uh, written expression difficulties usually have some form of dyslexia. It is a kind of a, dis, a rippling effect or a spilling over effect of dyslexia, which causes written expression difficulties. Sometimes it may have been very minor dyslexia. So if it is very, very mild, it may have gone unnoticed, but when the writing part comes, uh, it is more evident. So it's more like a uh, difficulty in written expression. So uh, having had a fair amount of idea on what is SLD, we we'll go back. To, we'll go into the classification of SLD based on the severity levels. So when we say mild SLD, what do we mean by that? Uh, that is, some difficulties are seen in the um, uh, in learning, especially in one or two academic areas. And usually these children, if we give some amount of supportive uh, in, uh, teaching and uh, you know, uh, add on some accommodations and modifications, especially with some accommodations, they are able to function in the mainstream school setting. Um, when it comes to moderate difficulties, there are some, uh, you know, difficulties are much more significant. Again, uh, more than two academic areas may be affected. And it requires not just some supportive teaching, but it needs more intensive remedial kind of specialized teaching. They may need more supportive services. Uh, for example, they may need uh, supportive services from say a counselor or a speech therapist uh, or a uh, occupational therapist. In addition, they may also need much more accommodations or modifications uh, when they have moderate uh, SLD. And, uh, the ones who have severe SLD, of course, the, the severity of the uh, problem is much more. So it is in several areas or almost all academic areas are affected. And uh, many of these children require ongoing intensive specialized remedial and supportive teaching, as well as accommodations and modifications probably throughout their academic life. And not just schools, uh, many of them would require these kind of uh, supports even in their uh, college education and probably in the workplace as well. So again, a different kind, uh, different levels of severity determine what is required. And uh, with intervention, with early identification intervention, you know, uh, a child uh, can be provided these if they are provided these as early as possible. The severity levels can be minimized and their effects can be minimized on the child's learning uh, curve. Now that we've understood SLD, there are certain uh, uh, related disorders or comorbidities that 
uh, conditions which coexist very commonly with uh, SLD. So one very commonly uh, seen situation which I've already mentioned is ADHD, uh, which is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or even ADD, which is attention deficit disorder, where the child may not be hyperactive and may not be moving around so much, but still even sitting in a place might find it difficult to attend to something for a uh, long time. So ADD or ADHD is a very commonly seen uh, difficulty, uh, um, a comorbid situation with SLD. Developmental coordination disorder, DCD, or even some people tend to call it uh, dyspraxia, where uh, difficulties with movement, uh, coordination, you know, uh, language and speech. Uh, so when they have these difficulties, they may have slight uh, uh, problems in moving their muscles properly, their fine motor skills with using their fingers. So this may affect their written skills. Uh, this uh, something. Uh, this may also affect uh, their speech skills. You know, so many of them may have pronunciation or misarticulations uh, difficulties because of uh, developmental coordination disorder. So anything associated with movement coordination and uh, musculature and joint movements. These uh, maintaining the correct posture for when they're reading, writing, or you know playing, etc. That can also affect. Uh, so. Many, some of these children, even in the playground, you can observe that some of them are very clumsy or they have difficulties, you know, uh, catching a ball if somebody throws them a ball. So many of these kind of uh, functionally say walking, running, they may not have a problem. So it's not very obvious. But if you observe closely, you can notice that these difficulties are there. Uh, challenges in executive functioning, which I've already mentioned with planning, organization, being able to prioritize what needs to do, be done first, what next, and so on. Um, in a big, they may get the gist of things, but they may miss out on the minute detailing of stuff. Uh, managing their time, their space, having a proper organized uh, workspace like a desk, etc. Sometimes you find they are so messy, whether it is their school bag or their de school desk. Um, and when then again, meeting time deadlines, being able to complete tasks on time. So all these executive function skills also, uh, you know, we did mention it's part of SLD, but sometimes specifically they may not, the academic difficulties may not be as much, but they may have executive function difficulties which are far more, which are affecting uh, academics. So we get children of all kinds of combinations and it is very hard to uh, sometimes say that a child has only reading disability or only executive function. A lot of times these are all present in some, uh, in some proportion in most of the children with SLD. Like I said earlier, sometimes they may only have dyslexia uh, according to a, a test or a, a dyslexia, you know, a test that is done, but that will also have a spilling over effect in say math areas. So when we uh, look at uh, remediation or providing them with supportive learning, you have to take a holistic uh, view and therefore provide services accordingly. So don't go just by the uh, diagnostic labels, but instead go by what the child's skills are, where the challenges are, where the processing deficits are, and therefore plan accordingly. So when we talk about planning and management of SLD, what can be done? We need to, again, as I said, don't view it as just a reading disorder or, you know, don't uh, try to avoid looking at the disabilities in the form of certain diagnostic labels. Instead, try to look at it more holistically because it is a whole child that we have to work on. So what do we have to, uh, when we look at the different uh, aspects, one of the early uh, steps in uh, helping a child or managing uh, difficulties is being able to screen them and identify these problems as early as possible. So this can be done through several kinds of observation checklists, like child development or academic development checklists. There can be certain screening tools that can be used. Uh, informal assessment, that is, you can, if the child comes to you at a certain age, you can go through the grade level skills and the requirements that are required of that particular grade level and see whether the child has these skills. 
uh, informal assessment is also looking at some of the criteria, uh, the academic skills that are men mentioned for each grade level and have, a, 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 you know, assess that and see where the child stands. Then you also have formal assessment where there are certain standardized tools that you can uh, administer and come up with a formal diagnosis. And then uh, diagnostic evaluation actually involves, sometimes it involves a lot of these things. Initially, the child may be screened, some supportive uh, teaching or education may be given, and then they may be reassessed. Uh, uh, informal assessment may be ongoing, and then there may be a formal assessment given, and then you arrive at a diagnostic evaluation. And with SLD, especially with the DSM-5, uh, we tend to kind of go into delabeling. So what we try and do is identify the learning difficulties as early as possible, provide the right kind of support systems, the accommodations, et cetera, rather than focus on the diagnostic evaluation. Usually, uh, as a clinician, I prefer if the diagnostic evaluation is kept up until high school when they have to appear for the board exams, where the boards require a diagnostic evaluation for the child to avail of certain kinds of provisions or uh, accommodations and modifications. Otherwise, I prefer going in for, uh, you know, screening and informal assessment, formal assessment if it is necessary to furnish a report. But otherwise, if it is for um, remediation purposes, an informal criterion-based assessment is grade level assessment is more than enough to, uh, to, understand, uh, to recognize what other areas the child needs uh, assistance in and therefore uh, plan a remediation program. So when we talk about intervention and if we are giving a remediation program or an intervention program, it includes a wide range of um, different uh, uh, ideas, uh, different uh, uh, things, which is one is placing the child appropriately. So not all children, again, because it's SLD, as much as possible, we do want them to go into regular schools, but a lot of children may not uh, be ready maybe in the initial stages, or they may be uh, successful in the early years of schooling, but as the curriculum gets more and more difficult and expectations are higher, they may not uh, be able to uh, function completely in a regular ed classroom. So they may need some time in a, say, a resource room model. And uh, especially with the severe uh, cases, the ch children who have severe difficulties, sometimes it is seen that when it comes to high school, they may have to go into a completely different stream of education, probably in segregated classrooms, uh, which can be made available even within the regular. Nowadays, a lot of regular schools are having parallel classrooms like these where the uh, class strength is uh, smaller and more uh, tailor-made uh, differentiated instruction can be provided to children with specific learning disorders. So appropriate placement is important and appropriate placement does not mean that it is, uh, you know, rock solid. You can start off with a certain kind of placement as the child progresses, as the curriculum advances, as the child goes through the higher grade levels, you may have to revisit the placement options and uh, you will need to uh, put the child in whichever uh, uh, placement model will enable the child to become more successful. It should also include provisions of various kinds of support systems um, that is supportive and remedial education, supportive education or remedial education, sometimes both, um, accommodations and modifications to help uh, the child, you know, uh, uh, stay in the mainstream or be as close to the mainstream as possible. Uh, some of these children uh, do need uh, therapies such as speech therapy or occupational therapy. Some of them, especially if they have very high ADHD, et cetera, they may need medical, uh, you know, medicines for ADHD. So they may need medical support uh, for the psychosocial uh, aspects, you know, dealing with anxiety, emotion, stress, both for the family as well as the child, you know, individual counseling or family counseling may be necessary. Many of these children may have some kind of sensory issues as well. So uh, may, may, the sensory issues may not be very visible, but uh, you know, uh, they do need sensory integration training. So you know, multi-sensory kind of approaches really help. 
because all uh, uh, all these uh, help in uh, their um, plugging in the gaps in learning social skills trainings uh, many a time we find some of them are very shy or withdrawn or some of them are over exuberant and especially if they have ld with um, adhd some of them can be extremely talkative to the point of you know uh, not listening properly etc so social skills training how to behave in different situations how to be how to ask for help how to um, you know uh, take help when necessary how to offer their expertise to become more confident individuals all these things are required and this is why inter intervention means it is a complete holistic package it is not just supportive or remedial education so when we talk about raising successful individuals uh, it needs to take into account all these different aspects and not everybody may need all of them but if a child requires then all uh, whichever aspect is necessary should be built into the intervention program to go about the general strategies uh, on uh, you know what uh, or how inclusive uh, uh, inclusion can be implemented especially with regard to sld children broad strategies called response to intervention Uh, universal design for learning and accommodations and modifications so in an inclusive school setup uh, universal design for learning includes certain uh, things under it to put in, uh, universal design for learning into a uh, place you need differentiated instruction that is tailoring learning activities learning uh, goals as well as the way they demonstrate their learning all this uh, In, into individualized educational programs so within the classroom itself you individualize whatever you're doing for the diversities that are or for the uh, deficits and challenges that the student presents then uh, multi sensory or multi modality learning because many of the children with sld may have uh, challenges especially when it comes to visual auditory or both uh, processing so therefore you need to supplement it and complement it with kinesthetic and tactile uh, mode as well so having a multi sensory modality helps them improve not only their weaker processing modalities but also um, helps them learn better through their stronger learning modalities cross curriculum teaching or learning that is uh, finding common goals i mean using uh, concepts and uh, developing skills through different kinds of subject areas that is also very important so what is we'll go into detail uh, in each response to intervention is it consists of a three tier approach the first tier is where all students are universally screened in a regular uh, school setting to uh, you know uh, to pick out children who may be at risk or who may be um, struggling so the rti facilitates uh, early identification So it is universal screening of all students in the regular uh, regular setting, so as to you can identify children and they may, these children who are struggling or having difficulties may or may not have SLD. Uh, it does not necessary that they need to have SLD as long as they are having difficulties, they are identified and supportive education or uh, you know uh, both in the learning uh, the academic learning area as well as the behavioral learning area. is provided through scientifically proven uh, teaching methodologies and their progress is measured and usually we find uh, if there is no real sld uh, then many of these children who may have been identified uh, do show considerable amount of progress and therefore they may not need tier 2 support but despite having given this targeted support if they still have difficulties then tier 2 support is needed where slightly more intensive uh, intervention is given where children may be pulled out of the regular classroom uh, into smaller groups and more targeted intervention given and then uh, tier 3 is where despite having given tier 2 also the children continue to have um, you know extreme struggle while uh, to achieve grade level concepts so then more individualized a one on one uh, kind of uh intervention is provided and response to intervention ideally it should always be provided within the regular school setting however uh, practically many schools simply do not have this 
Usually we find tier one and tier two levels of support in most schools that claim to be inclusive. Uh, the tier three support in many countries, uh, including India, is usually provided in um, clinical settings where they go to an uh, LD, SLD center or LSLD clinic where more individualized uh, uh, intervention is given. So, uh, but ideally, uh, you know, when you're planning for an inclusive setup, uh, all three tiers should be ideally given within the regular mainstream school set. UDL, I've already mentioned what UDL is. It is like, you know, uh, that we do not believe that according to UDL principle that one size or one curriculum fits everybody. It is about making the curriculum, the goals, the, the way you teach those goals, the way you the way that the children are engaged or motivated to join in the learning activities, all this, a lot of flexibility is given both for the students as well as the teachers to explore different uh, pathways or multiple pathways to achieving uh, academic success. And in uh, the three uh, main pillars of uh, UDL is uh, find, uh, giving multiple ways of engaging the student, motivating them, uh, and sustaining their motivation in learning tasks, present the learning content in different ways so that it, and, uh, you know, uh, children with different kinds of abilities, different kind of learning styles, different kind of learning modalities are able to access that information and understand them. And multiple means of action or expression, which is allowing children to demonstrate their learning. Like you know, uh, if, they, if you're evaluating them or assessing them, don't just assess through paper, pencil tests, but use a wide variety of uh, things like projects or oral discussions, um, you know, uh, uh, doing a, a show and tell. Basically, uh, giving the children multiple ways of expressing how, what they have learned to demonstrate their knowledge of the concepts they have learned. So this is the basic principle of UDL and under UDL as a subset of UDL is what we call differentiated instruction, where the content that is what the child is learning, the process that is the learning activities that the children uh, engage in, uh, and the product that is how they demonstrate their learning. All this is uh, you know, tailored to suit the needs of the particular student and also the learning environment like how you set up the learning centers, how you set up the uh, seating in the classroom. Uh, what is, um, you know, what are the rules, responsibilities, structure of the basic classroom? Basically how the classroom works and how it feels, the learning environment is therefore uh, altered or, uh, you know, a uh, to include the different kinds of learning needs of the students. Multisensory or multimodality learning, as I said, all the different senses are used, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and tactile. So even if the, uh, one or two modalities, are, they have difficulties in, the, the other modalities will compensate. And besides, the, the weaker modalities will also get strengthened because they're able to understand the content through their uh, stronger modality. So multisensory learning always helps in more wholesome learning and it, uh, it helps in better retention of uh, material that they learn. Cross-curriculum teaching or learning, which is across multiple academic disciplines. You teach intentionally plan topics accord, uh, accordingly. So if you're teaching a science topic, you can use the same topic to teach reading, writing. You can uh, alt, uh, use the same topic to teach your math skills as well. So trying to integrate language arts or math, science, art and craft, all these into thematic activities and teaching through that. So therefore you are not breaking uh, sub content matter into subject areas. In instead, you're trying to integrate them and teach accordingly. And this is particularly useful, especially in the primary levels where you know, the focus is mainly on literacy, that is learning to read and write, and numeracy, that is learning uh, basic math and arithmetic skills. So here, a lot of integrated cross-curriculum teaching really helps in uh, children understanding and retaining and applying their skills better. But this can also be used in higher level, uh, higher level uh, academic skills. And last but not the least, different kinds of accommodations and modifications, whether it when it comes to general language use, 
um, that the, the kind that the teachers use in the classroom use simple language more structured use words that the children readily understand at a particular age level uh, academic challenges if there are academic challenges then use different kinds of you know materials uh, uh, um, different kinds of support systems that will help overcome the uh, academic challenges like providing visual posters anchor charts or giving them uh, calculators etc behavioral challenges uh, you know having a behavior chart trying to shape and promote better uh, or more positive behaviors uh, having uh, if necessary having you know uh, things like a calm down corner where if they are frustrated and they want to vent out, they can, you know, go. Or if they have attention uh, deficit issues, giving them short breaks in between, helping them to move around rather than sit in a chair for long amounts of time. So a lot of accommodations and modifications uh, which will help change or shape their uh, behavior to more um, required classroom expectations. The same, uh, as I uh, talked about academic challenges, same goes for assessment and grading as well. Uh, when you're doing different kind, of, use different kinds of assessment. Don't stick to one paper pencil kind of tests and uh, exams. But instead, use projects or oral um, presentations or a PPT presentation, even drawings, painting, etc., for assessment and uh, grading and. When you're grading also don't take just one grade or two grades to give the final grade of the semester. Use a, a variety of grading tech, uh, grading activities as well as variety of grades and average them up so that it gives a better picture of the child's true potential. And of course, in today's world, we cannot but uh, mention use of technology audiovisual technological support, which helps in a lot of the supportive education, a lot of the accommodations and modifications can be through the use of technology. And these can be in the form of educational games, online quizzes, animated uh, videos, which, which show concepts through, you know, concrete uh, animations, et cetera. Uh, a lot of uh, picture presentations, all these, even um, you know, different kinds of softwares and apps, which uh, help overcome reading difficulties or listening difficulties, helps children to focus on, uh, and even things like spell check, grammar check, etc., which helps better with written expression. So, wide uh, amount of technological um, support can be used both in remedial, supportive education as well as providing accommodations and modifications to children with SLD. And assistive technology, as I already mentioned, you know, in reading comprehension area, TTS, text-to-speech, using graphic organizers, stories can be animated now. All these can help. Uh, calculators, video animations for uh, showing abstract concepts in geometry, et cetera, audiovisual games and songs that go with different um, concepts. Um, in writing, especially the physical uh, uh, part of writing, they can use word processor if they have difficulties with uh, fine motor manipulations and you know use of grammar check, spell check. Graphic organizers, again, a lot of these are available online. Some of them can be done online as well, or some of these are templates which you can print out and then the child can write them in. So many of these help with uh, written expression. So but basically, a lot of assistive technology can be used uh, and it is uh, an, um, you know, an, uh, a very uh, integral part of if you have to implement UDL, RPI, uh, you know, and all the uh, accommodations and modifications to help uh, children suc uh, find success in the mainstream school setting. And uh, different kinds of, when it comes to board exams, again, different kinds of boards provide different educational provisions to help, uh, you know, uh, help them perform better in their board exams. Um, some of the boards in India, the commonly, uh, most common board in India is CBSC or Central Board of Secondary Education, where they do provide a subject drop option, like too difficult to learn subjects can be dropped and instead they can opt for easier, more, hands-on subjects, um, which they may be interested or having a talent in. 
extra time is provided so uh, so that they can write at leisure the uh, you know the writing speed need not impede their performance use of calculators uh, providing a reader or an interpreter to read uh, questions to them the provision of ignoring spelling and grammar er errors uh, that is not um, penalizing them for spelling and grammar errors if the content of the answer is correct these are some of the cbsc um, provisions NIOS is another uh, open school uh, board, which is very, very popular among a lot of special needs children. And some of the moderate to severe SLD children also make use of NIOS. Here again, you know, reader, use of a scribe to write for them extra time, ignoring spelling, uh, grammar errors, etc. Um, uh, given. State boards. In India, we have almost 29 states and several union territories. Uh, and I'm sure in different countries, if you, especially in large countries, you may have different states which have different uh, regulations. So state boards, different boards have different kinds of provisions, but by and large, many of the ones that I mentioned above, uh, pretty much many of them do apply to most of the state boards. Uh, International General Certification of Secondary Education, that is IGCSE. Again, here use of scribe, write, reader, extra time. Sometimes the question papers are modified to suit uh, children with uh, SLD, assistive technology, a separate room uh, to, you know, to keep the, them free of distractions, rest breaks or having little breaks in between to help uh, to break the monotony of sitting and writing exams for a long period of time. These are all provided by IGCSE. IB, International Baccalaureate, again, very a uh, lot of schools in the international arena have this uh, board. And here again, they provide use of scribe, reader, or communicators, extra time, um, ICT, any kind of computer-based support, uh, modified papers, question papers, press breaks, et cetera. Uh, the key thing is most of these boards keep revising their accommodations and modifications. So while you're applying for provisions uh, for that, for whatever academic year you're applying for provision, do uh, make it a point to check the website of the relevant board for updated details of what are the accommodations and modifications that they are providing. And usually most of the boards mention the kind of disability. So this is where a diagnostic evaluation is a must. Uh, a formal diagnostic evaluation uh, is a must uh, to, uh, you know, to avail of the provisions uh, by the different boards. And some of the boards do mention the kind of tests that are required. So uh, you may have to, the formal uh, diagnostic evaluation may have to include the kind of tests that the board has stipulated. So uh, do check the website uh, for the relevant board when you're applying for provisions. So this is a sum up uh, of today's session. Basically, what is SLD? It's a, an information processing problem, which where there is a, you know, between the actual potential of the child and the actual performance, there's a gap or a discrepancy that is seen and it manifests as academic difficulties in schooling years. Early intervention is very key and crucial to identifying them because as you keep delaying the, early, the identification and the supportive education or remedial education and other supportive services, it has a snowball effect. So the problems keep increasing over time. So the, more, the earlier you, uh, you inter intervene, the, the, you know, the, the, the capacity of the professional, the family and the student you know, to minimize the, the condition uh, and help the child achieve greater success is very high. And effective management should not just uh, be related to academic uh, remediation alone. It should be very holistic and inclusive to meet all the different kinds of needs that the child has, be it, uh, you know, like I've mentioned earlier, whether it is psychosocial uh, aspects where counseling is needed or therapeutic intervention, any kind of intervention based on what this uh, child's needs are, that should be part of a uh, complete holistic um, management program. So with that, I come to an end of today's session. Thank you. Uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you so much, ma'am, for an informative session. Thank you for breaking down all the components into subparts and making it very, very easy for all of us to remember and retain this information.
before we move on to the Q&A segment, I would like to take the participants through a few things, ma'am. If you would let me share screen. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. So dear participants, as part of our module four, which focuses on academic challenges and identification, we have the next workshop, which is workshop number two on introduction to academic challenges, part two, where we focus on other conditions like ADHD, learners at risk, ID, and how all of this are having an impact on the academic challenges of children in the classroom setup, which would be conducted by Ms. Leah Gracila. It would happen on the 11th of November, 2021. And following that, we see a lot of questions on the screener tools. If you are interested for that, this is the workshop that you have to register. This workshop would focus on how to identify the early signs of academic difficulties in your classroom, which would again be conducted by Ms. Via Grasila. And this would happen on the 18th of November, 2021. The timing for all the workshop is 4 p.m. Indian time, 5.30 p.m. Indonesian time, 6.30 p.m. Singapore and Philippines time. If you're interested for any of the workshops, do register and book your slots today. And also don't forget to share the same with your fellow friends so that they can also benefit from the learnings from our expert speakers. Moving on, let me also now take you through how is that you will be able to register for all the events in our platform. All you have to do is to have an ability account. By logging in with your credential, you will be able to find all the events which are part of our inclusive school program. By clicking on the register for this event button, you will be able to just register for any event with the click of this button. And also, if you have any specific questions to the speaker on the topic that is of discussion, you can post your questions here. And if you don't have any questions, don't worry. You will be also be able to upload certain questions of other members. By clicking on this upload button, the number of questions which is getting uploaded for the most times would be the one that will be addressed by the speaker in priority. Not only that, as part of each of the workshops that you attend, relevant resources are also shared with you so that you can use them with your in your session with your children in different settings. As part of today's workshop, a set of resources are being shared with you. Do check out the links that are being shared right now in the chat box and also don't forget to rate the resources and let us know how effective it has been for you so that we'll be able to collate more resources that is of interest to you. Moving on. We also have, you will be able to find all the related in events which are of interest to you by clicking on the related events sub tab. All the events which are of interest to you would appear here. Not only that, all the events that you've been attending as part of the Ability platform as an Ability member, you will be able to keep a track of all of it by clicking on my events. All the events that you've attended would appear here. Now, I'd also like you like to take you all through the ability resource creation opportunity. So if you are a person who's been creating or curating resources to help children with special needs, this is an opportunity for you. By creating your profile in the ability platform and uploading the resources that you have created or curated, and you will be able to get the direct feedback from our community members and build your followers in our platform. You'll also get to share your resources with over 40,000 educators and parents and help them with the resources that you've created or curated. Not only that, we also have launched an Ability Inclusion Champion, which is a community initiative, which is in which you'll be able to meet members with the fellow who are, who are having similar interests and you'll also get access to free and amazing resources and tools uh, as part of the community. And you will also be able to run local online and offline support groups and lead initiatives to spread awareness about special needs in your community. And not only that, you're also able to meet new friends and get to learn from each other. We have about 400 plus volunteers who've taken their first journey to become our Ability Inclusion Champion. If you're interested to become an Ability Inclusion Champion or a resource creator, do check the link out and register your interest the team will get in touch with you. Now, we should start with the Q&A segment for today. Ma'am, are you ready to take yes. the first question that we have today? Yes. The first question is from Mr. Islam, who wants to know, you mentioned during your prevalence that it's very common during the age of five to seven years that most children are at risk for developing learning disabilities. So the question is, uh, can we identify learning disability in early years, especially in preschool years? Uh, if so, how? And also, uh, what is the right age for diagnosis and identification? If you could specify on it. Yeah. 
uh, at uh, five to seven years, generally, we do not call it a learning disability or learning disorder as such. What we actually look at is whether the child has a learning difficulty. Okay, uh, so a formal diagnosis is not done at that age, but we can see even if you are a regular uh, school uh, educator, one of the most common sense approach would be, you know, if you find that uh, most of the, almost all the children in your class are developing and learning the skills, but this particular child is having difficulties. So that is one of the most common, if this child is slipping or falling behind, that's one of the first indicators. And uh, having an idea about what each grade level uh, skills are. So if you, the child is in, say, uh, KG1 or lower KG, then what are the skills that uh, the uh, children need to know within that grade level? And if all the other or majority of the children are catching on, but this particular child or, say, one or two children are having difficulties, then you know the, that is a red flag indicator. Uh, uh, as you go, uh, so that is like, you know, in the preschool area, when it comes to uh, five to seven years, by then slowly children are into alphabets, numbers, et cetera. So you find that many of these children may not be catching on with these concepts. Um, in the preschool years also, you find that uh, children do have uh, difficulties with understanding color concepts, shape concepts, size concepts, such as, you know, big and small, uh, etc. So many of the preschool concepts that they are struggling with that itself is an indicator that they need some kind of uh, uh, supportive education right there. Despite after giving that they still st continue to struggle then you know that you know they may you can kind of foresee that they may have difficulties with alphabets numbers etc. So uh, these are the issues. Sometimes uh, in grasping concepts, they may not have a difficulty, but the moment you enter the world of letters and numbers, writing, they may have difficulties. So again, you know, look for uh, what the difficulties are and then see what can be done to uh, help ch uh, the children support, uh, get, uh, get supportive services in that area. Again, as I said, we do not diagnose at that age. Normally, uh, Formal diagnosis, especially in India, I know we have a rule, uh, we have a law that says, uh, according to the uh, right to, uh, you know, persons with disabilities act, that only after eight years or only after grade, uh, when the child uh, is in grade, after grade three, can you formally diagnose. Up until then, it is viewed as learning difficulties and the supportive uh, education, accommodation and modification, etc., cetera, are, uh, have to be given. And despite that, if the child is still struggling, then you can go in for a formal uh, assessment. And um, normally, as I said, eight years upwards, but even, uh, you know, uh, personally speaking, from my uh, experience, I generally don't prefer putting a, uh, I pref uh, put a, a label of SLD only when they come into high school or when they have to apply for board provisions. Because up until then, um, it is only after you've given complete holistic management to the maximum extent possible and the child is still struggling, can you say the child has SLD. Most often, uh, almost 90, 98% of the children who come to us have not got all the kind of holistic uh, services that is necessary. They may have got remediation, but they may not have got the other kinds of supports. So, you know, they, uh, when they, even if they've received some services early on, it may not be as holistic as I've mentioned. So you never know that whether it is actually a disability or it is, is it because the child did not get all the required supportive services. So we lay it open for, we give the child the benefit of doubt. Uh, but having said that, when it comes to board exams, unless we give a diagnostic evaluation, the child cannot avail of provisions. So therefore I prefer uh, giving a diagnostic evaluation at that stage especially with SLD. The other uh, disabilities, it's different because their criteria is different. With SLD, the, the criteria is very in much in the gray area. So I prefer doing it uh, at that stage. Thank you for clearing air on it, ma'am. And also elaboratively talking about what is the right age and also specifying what you think would be the best way to go about it. Mm -hmm. Next, we have a question from Ms. Preeti Swami. 
who wants to know that can we independently just work on academic challenges of the child or do we also have consider other facets for having a successful intervention because you mentioned about having a holistic intervention right if you holistic elaborate... intervention is necessary because academic see when it comes to sld you have to realize the academic uh, challenges that they face is the symptom okay what is behind it what is causing that symptom of academic challenges is the processing difficulties the executive functioning difficulties all these so unless you tackle all those areas you are uh, what you will what you will be doing is is giving a cosmetic kind of intervention which is unfortunately what is happening to a lot of children with sld uh, it is mostly seen just as an academic problem and it's not just with professionals it's also with parents many of them think okay it's just an academic problem the child is bright and smart in all the other areas so therefore a little bit of intervention and if the child catches up everything is fine but the thing is if it is sld it is a neurodevelopmental disorder it's not going to go away you can minimize the effects but it is still going to remain in the child system so therefore the child will have to be given a specific strategies to cope with these kind of things uh, and especially with the severe sld they may continue to need some bit of you know coping strategies and uh, so for example if uh, they have had dyslexia you can give a re reading remediation to a great extent and make them reasonably fluent readers but again having said that it doesn't mean they read without effort there will still be effort it may not be visible so they will get exhausted if they have to read large amounts of reading material especially when they come to the higher classes or come to a job situation etc so therefore you they will have to find a coping strategy or an assistive technology to uh, to counter or compensate for that uh, exhaustive or um, effortful reading so uh, it is uh, it has to be holistic otherwise you are only tackling the surface of the problem you are not going to the uh, deep roots of the problem thank you so much ma'am for emphasizing on the component of going to the root of the problem and addressing that in addition to the question just an extent, extension question on similar lines from ms teresita dimesa and ms jayshri sehel who wants to know like what are some of the emotional concerns that children with learning disability face or go through and what as teachers can be done to support them to help them uh, through this emotional journey uh yeah i've already mentioned uh, the psychosocial things uh one thing is because it's an invisible or hidden disability uh many a time these children uh, teachers parents everybody mistake uh, you know uh, these uh, academic difficulties to be just lack of interest or not putting in enough effort etc and after some time these children also lose interest because of the struggles and the lack of support that they get so what happens is many of them do get frustrated they try to avoid academic related tasks uh, they try to especially writing written tasks try to avoid that uh, some of them may have absolute fear or anxiety when it comes to appearing for tests or exams or even certain subject areas you know if they have great difficulties in math then the before the math lesson itself they'll be all uh, anxious and you know nervous and everything so all these things can occur and um, fear of failure they are very many of the elderly children are very low risk takers they will not attempt anything new for have, uh, you know fearing what if they fail so uh, what has they have to be made understood is it is okay to make mistakes because a lot of times we find whether it is teachers or its parents they react very sharply to the the kind of errors these children make we have to understand that they, these errors are because of certain processing issues for example if they are spelling the same word in 10 different ways in the same page i mean no child will do that unless there is a real problem and the child is not able to recognize it right so we have to understand uh, what the uh, difficulty the child is facing and provide uh, the right kind of support if they make mistake it's okay just just tell them it's okay just attempt it if there is a mistake made try and correct that mistake do it in a calm manner 
without uh, you know reacting in a uh, sharply to it make the children comfortable start them from a known level of what they know and then go on another thing is uh, many of them have problems with uh, remembering things over time memory issues relating to academic concepts so keep refreshing the core concepts uh, all along you know uh, continuous and a very intermittent review is necessary for all the core concepts so that they don't forget it over time sometimes if you uh, taught certain concepts at the beginning of the year by the end of the year they've forgotten them unless you keep it alive through uh, you know uh, periodical reviews and revisions so all this is very important and all this will help also the uh, learning environment you create in your classroom you know um, when the child does perform sometimes the answers may not be correct but at least the child has made an effort in the right direction uh, so then if, if suppose you're asking the child to read a word the child doesn't read it correctly but at least the child makes an attempt to sound the word out which is a, a, a an effort in the right direction so praise the child for that you know so uh, you can always say you know yes you try to sound it out which is wonderful but you know uh, the this is how you actually have to read the word this is what it reads uh, this is what it comes to so uh, getting them to be more confident individuals that is very important and a lot of children with sld do have very low self esteem because of repeated negative learning experiences and repeated failures so it is very very important that those things are equally paid attention to whether it is uh, from the school environment the home environment as well as all the professionals working with them and this can be done in very very small ways uh, not not big rocket science technology but it has to be understood that these have to be constantly worked on beautifully said ma'am a child never fails to feel what he feels and remembers it for a very long time so responding to the child and praising the child's effort than the outcome is the crucial component that teachers can do to help any child and especially children with special needs next we have a question from ms asha sharma and hain to sir who wants to know uh, we spoke about udl multi sensory learning cross -cur curriculum learning and things like that so this question is on similar lines they want to know how is that to keep prepare classroom instructions for diverse or mixed learners in a way that every uh, child's unique need is met is there any tip uh, uh, yeah all these are good frameworks uh what it requires is a lot of planning okay so one of the first things to do is if the school is planning to go inclusive then have some common planning time for the teachers for example if you're teaching grade 1 and there are several sections in grade 1 have all the grade 1 teachers uh you know at least schedule some common planning time for all those teachers so they can uh, brainstorm about different kinds of ideas that is one thing so different teachers from the same grade level you know saying what they uh, do what works in their classroom sharing of ideas really help another thing is uh, when you are um, in a thumb rule you know if you are teaching a particular concept when you are thinking of multi sensory learning think of a way uh, how you can do it in the oral way okay oral then performance that is either through art and craft or music Uh, or game or whatever and then of course the, the more traditional way which is paper pencil so read and write way so any concept if you can use at least three different activities with each concept that is one one is oral which is speaking and listening uh, um doing some activity related to the topic through speaking and listening could be a group discussion could be the children can bring in pictures and talk about it etc um same with uh, performance oriented tasks it could be an art and craft activity it could be a skit uh, uh singing a song action song or um, you know have playing some games relating to the topic and then of course uh, the traditional paper pencil worksheets and you know what they normally use widely in the school setting so with every concept if you can bring in all three you will be hitting at multi modality and then um, uh, another thing you have to think of is when you do cross curricular in the primary classes it's usually easier because uh, in many schools do have one teacher handling all the core subjects in a primary classroom so then what you can do is you don't have to do everything uh, broken subject wise 
So if I'm teaching a science topic on animals, I can use the same topic uh, for, um, you know, uh, use words from the same topic for reading and use a pa passage from the same si uh, science topic for reading comprehension. So I'll be hitting at science as well as reading comprehension. From that itself, I can plan a written composition activity. Okay, so this is how cross-curriculum works. And if you're teaching animals, then you can even bring in your math concepts. Like, you know, um, when you're doing addition, talk about the different kinds of animals and use animals for addition, or if you're teaching addition. So this is how cross-curriculum works. And again, here in cross-curriculum, it is easier in the primary classrooms, but again, in the middle and high school, I've, I, I have seen this happen. Again, what it requires is some common planning time. Uh, if the teachers get some common planning time, then uh, we can do that. Even in assessment and grading, this is possible because we can use one particular test uh, question paper and the same question paper is used to, uh, to grade the English or the language arts part of it. And the same question paper is used to grade the science part of it. So the science teacher will look for the scientific content and answers, whereas the English, uh, the language arts person will um, mark it uh, based on not only the content, but also the spellings, the sentence structure, uh, the grammar, punctuation, etc. So uh, it is possible, it just requires a bit of uh, planning to be done. Planning is the key to go. A question on similar lines, ma'am, because we are talking about using multimodal approach, right? So one of the questions is from Ms. Hazrat Ali, who wants to know that what is your take on having a uniform curriculum and syllabus all over the country? So do you think it is beneficial for children with special needs or it's counterproductive to them? Some standardization of curriculum is okay. Uh, rather than going for the content of the topics, what I would say is the skills can be kind of uniform. Because in most places, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of skills that the children require. If the skills are laid out, most of the skills are laid out according to the age levels, chronological age and in each grade level, what, um, uh, you know, what is required of the child. So if the skills are laid out, it doesn't matter what the content of the curriculum is. You can even use things which are not textbooks or material which are not in the school system. Uh, to promote those skills. So it depends on, um, you know, uh, the core skills can be uh, common, but the, the content you're using can vary depending on the region. I mean, especially in a country like India, which is very, very diverse, every state or every, even within a state, every region uh, has its own diversities. So um, as long as, uh, you know, if, for example, if you're talking about animals, again, I'm just using a, uh, an example. You can talk about animals in general, but then, you know, focus more on the animals that are more prevalent in that particular area, especially in the younger classes, rather than teach animals which are not even present in that area. Same when you teach vegetables and fruits, you know, you teach that in preschool, naming different vegetables, naming different fruits. Go for more what is locally relevant. And then as they grow older, they can learn things which are not relevant, which are in the, um, in the rest of the country or across the world. So a uh, common curriculum should be more in the way of the, the, the kind of skills that they acquire, not necessarily in the content. Thank you so much, ma'am. Next, we have a question from Mr. Wakar Aslam, who wants to know, you spoke about the VAKT method, right? He wants to know the little details of it. How, what is it actually, and how is that it can be implemented in a daily classroom teaching? I've already, I think I've already answered that question when I said follow a thumb rule. VAKT is visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and tactile. So any kind of uh, topic that you're teaching, think of a visual mode to present that matter and visual activities such as pictures or movies um, or even uh, you know doing uh, certain um, acting it out, et cetera. Auditory that is providing uh, say a, a running commentary on uh, what is happening or recorded sessions, both audio visual recorded sessions where the child can go back and listen to it again. Um, you can also give, uh, you know, uh, uh, kinesthetic and tactile, which is actually 
more difficult. So think of activities such as art and craft activities or games um, uh, or uh, projects that the child can go and do, like search the net and do uh, collect information about the topic, etc. Tactile, again, very closely related to a kinesthetic. Well, which you know you can actually manu use manipulative the real objects etc related to the topic or at least models of the uh, topic that you're teaching and particularly when you're talking about you know science social studies etc having things like puzzles you know jigsaw puzzles where say the digestive system is in the form of jig jigsaw puzzles or um, there are foam uh, pullouts of different organs of the body where the children have to place the different organs of the body and uh, make up the uh, human body. So, uh, you know, these kind of things actually help um, teach rather than just teaching them through a book. Besides, if you're teaching the parts of the body, they can also, you know, have action songs that go to it and they point to it. So there you have the kinesthetic, tactile, visual and auditory happening at the same time. So anything that you're doing, think of a listening, speaking component, think of a doing component, think of a paper pencil component. These three will touch your multimodality. So using multiple senses is the key to really a key method. Next, we have a question from Ms. Sonam Shivdasni, who wants to know, you spoke about the different provisions which are offered by different boards, ma'am. But as teachers, it's very challenging for us to implement these provisions which are mentioned, even during the classroom or during the assessment. What can be done in such situations so that it can be very practical for all of us to use and implement? Um, actually, uh, many of these board provisions are not so difficult to implement. In, and in fact, I am pretty much against the idea of just having provisions for uh, only the board exams. The provisions, um, the accommodations and modifications should be av made available to the child, which is uh, right from when the child's difficulties are identified and the supportive services have to be put in place. And it has to be reviewed from time to time. What the board offers is what is required at that time, you know, at that age or at that grade level. When the child is younger, you may not even need such high uh, end uh, provisions. So uh, it depends on what the child needs at what particular age the child is in, what are the deficits and challenges they have. And these accommodations and modifications have to be reviewed from time to time. Uh, so uh, it is not difficult if, if the school allows for it. Say a lot rests on the school management and what philosophy they espouse. If they are accommodative enough to, uh, you know, to provide these in the classroom, that can be done. We also, uh, in a regular classroom, we also use a lot of peer uh, support. Like the other children, other students in the classroom who are pretty, you know, who do not have any um, academic issues, uh, they can be used as effective helpers for these children and provide good supportive services. What I have done is, you know, sometimes if a child has difficulty copying from the board or, you know, uh, with the, if there is a, a lot of written work to be done, then I let the child do some of it. But whatever the child misses, I get his peer, what I, we call peer buddy. The peer buddy helps in uh, covering up. Or you can do small accommodations, like if there is a lot of copying from the board to be done. Minimize the amount of written work for the child. So say if you're giving a reading comprehension passage, the passage can be typed up and stuck in, on the notebook. Even the questions can be typed up. So the child will have to only write the answer. So you reduce the amount of dependence on excessive writing. So this is how you give different kinds of accommodations and modifications according to the children. And it's not difficult, believe me, it's, it's, um, I have actually worked in schools where this is done. Uh, it is if whether the school is allowing those things to be done. Uh, a lot of times we find there is a, uh, you know, schools claim to be inclusive, but in the right, what they do is in the resource room, everything works, all the support systems are provided, but in the regular classroom that is not done. But if you want a truly inclusive school, these have to be implemented in the regular classroom as well. And it's not just for special needs or SLD children. Uh, with the 
UDL approach, it's for all students. Uh, the what the benefits of UDL is for all students and uh, UDL is, uh, you know, it is absolutely necessary for uh, children with special needs, but it is equally beneficial for all students. So if you have an UDL approach, you will be allowing these kinds of things. It will become very organic within the classroom to use these things. Because, uh, for example, when I was teaching maths, I would have a calculator, I would have a number line, I would have counters uh, available. So whichever student wants to use whichever tool, they can use it. And if they don't use any, want to use any tool, they can do it mentally, so be it. But that flexibility is given. Thank you so much, ma'am, for making it very, very practical and also sharing your personal input. I'm sure it will benefit a lot of members from our community. Next, we have a question from Ms. Usha Krishnan, who wants to know uh, what are some of the ways to address the challenges faced by children with non-verbal learning disabilities? Basically, you have to train them in those areas. You have to identify what are the difficulties they have, if they have problems with directionality, right, left. Um, normally, what I do is I usually have something called a you know, a desk card or a name card, and I have left and right written there. So whenever you're talking about left, uh, writing something on the left hand side, right hand side, they have something visual uh, on the desk, which shows them which is the left and which is the right. Uh, this is one, uh, one very commonly seen difficulty. Um, other things like if they have organizational difficulties or, uh, you know, help them organize their uh, stuff. You know, you can actually, uh, I have, what I used to do was I used to have actual tapes uh, put up on their desks where, you know, they, they know where to keep the pencil pouch or where, uh, where to keep their uh, books, where to keep uh, their uh, additional stuff. Or if they have, if they have a huge bag, then, you know, where to hang their bag under the desk or put them under the chair or hang them behind the chair. Give, um, make these provisions possible. So um, these kind of small accommodations can be made, even inside in their school bag, if they are having organization difficulties. I would ask the parent to label each pocket of the school bag as books. And probably, you know, when you label it, if the child is not up to a high reading level, you can put the word as well as the picture. So books in one pocket of the school bag, pencil pouch in another, lunch box in another, and so on. So there are little things like these that can be done. Depends on what uh, what challenges or difficulties the child has. According to that, you have to weigh, uh, think of a way to help them uh, circumvent that. Thank you so much, ma'am, for sharing your insight. Next, we have a question from Ms. Shruti, who wants to know, are there any chances or have you seen any cases in your like experience where the child has more than three or more of the SLD types that you mentioned? If so, what are the ways to go about it? What is the first challenge that we'll address in such cases? Actually, with most of the kids who come to us, as I said, it is, you, it is very rarely you get a child who has only dyslexia or only dyscalculia. Um, usually there is a big overlap in these areas. Um, with most, uh, we already mentioned in the prevalence that uh, the most commonly seen SLD is dyslexia or reading related disorders. And this has a ramification, big rippling effect in all the other areas. So if they have problems with reading, their comprehension gets affected. Um, and when their comprehension is affected, you know there are certain executive functioning skills that are required for uh, comprehension, which gets affected. Uh, so then uh, if they have difficulty with reading and comprehension, written expression definitely gets affected. And uh, because, uh, as I said, again, the reading, uh, when we see it as dyscalculia, dyslexia, dysgraphia, we are just seeing the, the tip of the iceberg. But what lies underneath this uh, is, why are they not able to do the math? Why are they not able to read? It is because of certain processing difficulties. And the processing could be visual processing, um, you know, whether they are able to perceive the uh, letters or numbers correctly, whether they're able to remember this letter sound association or the number, uh, the numeral and the number of objects that they associate with. 
So all these, the processing is what is involved. That is affected. So therefore, see, if a child has difficulties in logical reasoning or, uh, um, or you know, in sequencing events, that will show in uh, if the child has to read, tell a story in English. So if the child has to read and then tell you the events in order, in sequential order, that uh, problem will be there. The same problem will be seen in math also, where the child has to solve a problem step by step because the child is able is having difficulty in the processing of the sequence the order so if the order is impaired the ordering is impaired that processing is impaired it will uh, it will affect the science the english the math whatever okay so the information what whatever skill is affected it will have a rippling effect on the different academic areas so the academic areas are just the manifestations of a much deeper processing difficulty. That is a core thing to understand with SLP. And uh, one has to work on. So it is not enough to teach a child to read, but to teach a child how to read. When you see a new word, what do you do? That is what needs to be taught. So working on the skill component and the skill deficit is the key. Exactly. The skills and processes are far more important than the content. The content will come. If the skills and processes are there and you are teaching the content through the skills and processes, that will come. Thank you so much, ma'am. Let's take the last question for today. We spoke about a lot on the dimensions of teachers. Let's come to the other paradigm of shift where we're talking about the parents. So as teachers, when we approach parents and we feel that the child is having some challenges with learning or academics, how is that we can put it forth to the parent without offending them or offending the rights of the children? If you could share some insight from your end, it would be really helpful for all. That is an ongoing challenge throughout my career and particularly with SLD, because uh, as I said, with the other disabilities, it is very visible and obvious, whether it's a hearing, hand, um, visual impairment, hearing impairment, intellectual disability or autism, all these very commonly seen uh, developmental disorders. Uh, it is very obvious to, uh, you know, to anybody that there is a difficulty. Whereas with the SLD, they seem to be normal in every other respect and it, uh, it shows up more in the area of uh, academics, but what they don't realize is, you know, it is not just an academic problem, because if it is just an academic problem, you can give some tuitions and tu extra tutoring and the child will catch up. It is because that there is a greater uh, processing issue, which is resulting in an academic problem that uh, the children struggle throughout or in some, uh, in some way or the other throughout their life. And um, yes, convincing the parents is very, very difficult. But again, if the school has a universal procedure, this is why RTI, again, as I said, if we have RTI, UDL, et cetera, in place, it helps. Because when you're uh, putting in RTI or response to intervention in place, there is a universal screening given to all students and nobody is labeled. The only labeling that is happening is so, so these students are at risk or are struggling and therefore need support. That is all we are going, uh, you know, uh, that is all that is being mentioned. And if it is done within the umbrella of the regular schooling, generally parents are more accepted. But having said that, again, yes, we do have a lot of parents who are in denial. We have to understand that uh, as parents or as human beings, basically, nobody likes to be told that their child ha has imperfections. You know, we all like to believe uh, everything is good and hunky-dory. So uh, it is very, very important to, um, to sit and explain to the parent that right now it is probably, we are just seeing some indicators but if we do not address it now, it may snowball into a greater problem later on. So again, as I said, don't bother about diagnostic labels at that point. Just identify what the difficulty is, what supportive services need to be put in place. And if these services are not put in place and the child does not get the benefit of it, explain to the parents that this is what could happen later on. Now, at the after all this, again, they may accept it for a time. After some time, again, parents think once the child starts some, you know, showing some progress because of interventions and all that, uh, then they start thinking, okay, I, now my child is okay. Uh, the child can go, you know, 
go into the mainstream without support. And unfortunately, many a time, you know, that's why um, periodic counseling is always necessary to keep the parents uh, continue to send their children to um, um, intervention programs or supportive services as long as it's necessary. Um, but again, as I said, it's a, it's a constant effort in that direction. Many parents do drop out once they find their children is almost caught up with the class without realizing that, um, you know, uh, take off that intervention support and the child will float. Usually we find that in my experience, I've seen the child will manage somehow for the next six months or possibly a year. But after that, they again began, begin to slowly uh, slip back. And uh, sometimes the parents do notice the slipping back and they come back to us. Sometimes they don't, they wake up when it is high school. And by then a lot of time has been lost. So again, spreading a lot of awareness um, and especially if schools have special ed department, counseling department, conduct regular, um, you know, at periodic intervals, conduct these kind of programs for parents to increase their awareness about uh, this. Uh, and as far as possible, avoid um, the labels, diagnostic labels, because that's where the, the, uh, the parents have trouble with, you know, saying, okay, my child has SLD or my child has so and so. Especially with SLD, they, they have a great problem um, accepting that. And they accept that only when it comes to high school, because then the children will definitely, many of them do need to apply to the board for provisions. And uh, the good thing is if they are, that is another thing to explain to the parents that especially if they are very mild uh, issues and so on, in the early stages, if you identify and if you give the right supportive services, you may not even need a lot of the accommodations and modifications or board provisions later on. So awareness, not labeling the child for the condition or the diagnosis per se, and like in giving them the overall picture on how it will impact the child throughout their life and the holistic development of the child is the important and the key aspect to go about it. Thank you so much, ma'am. Very, very practical learning that we had with your session today. And I've seen that the feedback link for today's session has already been shared with the participants. I would request my team members to again share the feedback link. Do take your moment out and let us know how effective the session was for you so that we'll be able to improve the experience with all of you all. Now I'd like to check with Geeta ma'am as to what her experience has been and her final words to all our participants today. Uh, I've been for so quite some time associated with the ability community, whether it's the participants or the, um, the panelists. So as always, it's a pleasure. Uh, I love the way the participants respond uh, with their feedback uh, or even with the questions and things we put forth uh, during the workshop. So it shows that they're actually listening and you know, um, there's a lot of active listening going on there and active participation. So it's always a pleasure to come back to the Ability platform. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to interact with such a wonderful community. Thank you so much, ma'am, for making it very practical and simple for all of us so that we can use it in our practice in our different settings. Thank you, dear participants, for actively participating throughout today's session. I would like to again remind you all, as part of a module four, which is focusing on academic challenges and identification, we have an upcoming workshop on introduction to academic challenges part two, which would happen on the 11th of November, conducted by Ms. Indaya Grasira. And following that, we'd be talking about how to identify early signs of academic difficulties in your classroom, which would happen on the 18th of November. If you are interested for this workshop, do not forget to register yourself and book your slots today. Stay tuned for further updates from Team Ability. It's a big bye from all of us. Stay safe and take care.